É realmente uma honra para mim apresentar o último plenarista de hoje, é o professor Luiz Nunes Vicente, que, na minha opinião, é possivelmente o mais destacado otimizador português da sua geração. Ele estudou, fez graduação em Coimbra, onde tem uma forte ligação com o mais destacado otimizador português da geração anterior, que seria Joaquim Judice, que é bem conhecido do IMPA e frequente visitante. Luiz depois fez doutorado em RAIS, acabou mais ou menos em 1996. Voltou para Coimbra, onde ficou durante muitos anos como professor, e faz dois, an dois anos passou aos Estados Unidos, a Pensilvânia, onde trabalha na Lehigh, pronuncia Lehigh, não sei como pronuncia isso. Bom, Sim. Lehigh University. Ele é autor de mais de 70 artigos publicados nas melhores revistas e hoje vai falar sobre multi-objective uh, uh, multi stochastic optimization and uh, supervised machine learning. Eu sempre acho que você nunca deve deixar uma máquina aprender sem supervisão, pode aprender alguma coisa que ela não deve. Aproveito também a oportunidade apenas para anunciar, já que estamos na utilização estocástica, que hoje, no Congresso Internacional de Otimização Estocástica em Trondheim, um ex-estudante do IMPA, Philip Thompson, ganhou o prêmio do Pacova Precova ao melhor artigo de otimização estocástica publicado por um estudante nos últimos três anos. Então, como ele é daqui da casa, aproveito para fazer um pouquinho de propaganda, não, não custa nada. Então, Luiz, por favor. Okay. Uh, thank you. I will actually speak in, in, in English. I could, sp I could speak Portuguese, but then, then you will be saying oi, oi, oi <laughs> all the time. Uh, no, I have the microphone. Thank you. Um, so, yes, I am now at, at, at Lehigh. Um, let's see, you know, life is very, uh, life is a mystery and we never know where we're going to be. But for the moment, I mean, at Lehigh, I still keep my connection to, Port to, to Coimbra, to the Center of Mathematics of the University of Coimbra in Portugal. Um, Lehigh is a small private university between Pennsylvania, uh, Philadelphia and New York City. Um, I think two people are very well known um, Two scientists or two discoveries are very well known from Lehigh. One is the escalators, escadas rolantes, was in, invented by someone that graduated from Lehigh. And the, and the second thing is actually the thing I'm going to talk about. It's the, 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 um, the, uh, the stochastic graded algorithm, which is the, 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 the workhorse in machine learning, was discovered in the 50s by Monroe and Robbins, and actually Monroe was from Lehigh. And this is actually what not machine learning is all about, in, in essence, is a, a, a stochastic gradient. So uh, uh, this is the end of the day. It's the, uh, towards the end of the, of the, the, um, of the conference. So I'll, I'll, although I have 52 slides, I'm going to skip a number of them. I'll try to make my talk today as light as possible. Um, so. The, say the first 30 minutes will be uh, some basic material about uh, data science and learning, then about uh, 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 stochastic optimization, in particular uh, stochastic gradient, then also about multi-objective optimization, and then the, the part of that I will talk about that, the, that has to do with my research is the topic number four, where I, I kind of put everything together and give the application to, to, uh, to learning. Okay, so uh, let's try to simplify things as much as possible and consider that we have, um, that our data sets for analysis are of this form, D, uh, so pairs of features or attributes and, and, and A's and, and labels uh, denoted by Y's, okay? So essentially we can think about A's for instance as being uh, patients that are trying to be diagnosed and the Ys could be just you know, a negative and a positive. And we're trying to, to, you have some data about existing patients, and then you want to, 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 to build something that later on, if the patient comes, we can see from, his, from the data, 
from the, from the A is whether it will be a positive or a negative, you know, whether Y will be a positive or a negative. So this, the, the whole purpose of, uh, say, machine learning in general is to find a prediction function, which we go, I'll denote in my talk by phi, that matches the A's into the Y's, matches the, 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 the features into the labels. Of course, there, there, there won't be a perfect matching, so we have to define a sense how, how we're going to do this matching. Uh, but that's the, the, that's the goal. Um, um, things have to be practical, and so we cannot just consider any kind of function. So typically what people do is that people you know, work with some algebraic form for functions. So, so the, the variables of, of, of the true problem are denoted by x. The x are the parameters that define a function. I'll see, we'll see an, an example later. Okay? So x is, the x's are define the functions and, 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 and define the phi. And so our goal is really to find x. Um, the process of finding x, also, meaning the process of finding this prediction function phi, is what is called learning or training. Okay? Um, when the y's are reals, because the y's could be mm, vectors, when the y's are reals, we have what is called a regression problem. In particular, if the y's lie in a finite set, then we have what is called a classification problem. And this is finite set only has two elements, we have binary classification. Um, however, and although I, don't, don't, I will not address this in my talk, there might be no labels, there might be no whys, okay? Um, in that case, typically we have problems which are called clusterization, where we want to group the different features in different, in different groups. Or we might want to find uh, low dimensional subspaces or collection of low dimensional subspaces where the features lie. And this is called uh, subspace identification. Um, I will uh, uh, address the case where the labels exist. Um, to make things more complicated in, in the real, real world machine learning, the labels might have to be learned while we learn phi. In other words, we don't have all the data available to do the data analysis. The data is online, can be streamed. Okay? Um, we also assume that the data is clean for optimization. David Donahoe, that some of you might know, the, the famous statistician from, from Stanford, says, claims that 80% of the work in, in data analysis, in machine learning, etc., is to really clean up the data, you know, come up with the data sets for which one can do statistics. Um, uh, and even if we assume that the data has been clean for optimization, we can still have, th have, have things that make our life complicated in optimization, uh, uh, the data could be noisy or corrupted. Some, some pairs may have uh, features or uh, 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 labels missing, and data can be arrived in a, uh, in a streaming fashion. So this is why it's very important when we are learning phi that we do it in a robust way. In other words, in a way that uh, 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 changes in the data do not change so much our, uh, the prediction that we have learned. And, and learning is optimization in this sense. Okay, so a bit, a bit of terminology here. Uh, so machine learning can be classified as supervised when, say, the labels exist, the whys exist, or unsupervised when the labels do not exist, okay? Um, unsupervised learning is sometimes called data mining. Um, and here, as I said, the idea is to do some subspace uh, or some clusterization, you know, extracting interesting information from data. Um, by the way, I, I, I lecture a course called Optimization Methods for Machine Learning and Data Analysis last year at Lehigh. Um, I know there are some people writing books right now on mathematics for data science, on optimization for data science, etc. But there is none yet written for optimization for, math for, for, for machine learning and data science, so I had actually to read many papers and, 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 and chapters of the book and come up with my own synthesis. I did write some notes there on my web page if, if, and they can, they, they can be downloadable. Um, so, uh, then we have to find the, the prediction function and the, finding this prediction function is just finding the x uh, uh, such that some um, uh, accurate uh, matching of the data is minimized. So we need a way to, to quantify uh, 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 this, this misclassification. It's typically measured by what is called a loss function. So uh, the, the problem is parameterized by the A's and the, and the, and the, 
and the y's, but that it is the x that we are trying to find. Um, to avoid overfitting to, the, the, to, to d, so that the, the prediction is robust, if we have a new d, typically what, what, is, what is done is to add what is called a regularizer. And a regularizer can, is, I mean, in, the, in a simple, simple sense, can be something like a positive multiple of, say, the, the L1 norm or the 2 norm. And, and in this way, the phi is not going to be so sensitive to changes in D. And the problem is more uh, uh, pleasant for optimization, so to speak. So I would say that all these optimization models that we see in data science and machine learning, they are this form. There is a, a function f uh, that is typically smooth um, that reflects the, 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 the minimizing the mismatch. And, and, and there is kind of a regularizer that is typically a convex function but can be non-smooth. Uh, the, the example is actually, the, the, for instance, the L1 norm here. Okay? Uh, these functions, G, are typically functions for which we know the, well the analytical expression. Um, so that's, 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 that, 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 that is what optimization is, is, is applied to. Um, now, let me give an example, and the example this is going to, I'm going to use later on in my talk when I will give uh, the numerical results. It's, co it's called the logistic regression for binary classification. So we have binary classification means that we have just two labels, say one and minus one, and so there is data, and what we want to do is that we want to find a classifier, in this case a linear classifier here, an hyperplane that separates the data, okay? Uh, so that uh, we, when we, we have a new, for instance, suppose this could be you no know, um, uh, uh, positives and negatives, each point corresponds to a patient. The idea is that a new patient arrives, and, and then we'll see from which side of the upper plane is, and we can have an indication to the doctor whether this is potentially a positive or a negative. And so uh, the, the, uh, I'm sort of abusing notation here. My, my x now is the w and the b. The w and the b is what I'm trying to find, okay? Um, so so the, other, uh, the A's and the Y's are known. This is a part of the data that's, that is coming. So, so this is a linear classifier, and our uh, aim is to find a linear classifier that prop properly sets, uh, separates the data. In other words, that is, that we are on, on one side of the hyperplane when we have a Y equal to 1, and we are on the other side of the upper plane when it is minus 1. Of course, in this case, the error of misclassification is 0, because the hyperplane perfectly separates the data, this is not the case in general. Okay, now, how do we do this? Um, um, the, the, typically, we have to come up with a, with a kind of a loss function, and there are, I, I, there are two ways, actually, to motivate these loss functions, and I will, I will try to cover both. One, when it is what, what, what I wrote here on the, on the board, which is somehow kind of a geometric smoothing kind of approach, what we really want to do is to actually minimize the indicator function of these. Now, when we don't want the sign of these to be different from y. We want the sign of these to be, to be equal to y. So when this is equal to 1, this is bad, right? So we want these ones to be 0. So we want to minimize these. Now, if I call this w transpose i minus b equal to z, I see that the function that is hidden here in the true um, misclassification uh, notion is actually a, a very bad function in the sense that it's discontinuous, uh, it's even more than being non-smooth, it's discontinuous. So what people have been doing in machine learning is to, to smooth this function. And, and there is a big, big, big area called support, support vector machines where essentially the, this function is approximated by this, it's called a hinge loss. Now this function is nice in the sense that it's continuous but it's still, there's still a kink here, so it's still non-smooth. And the logistic loss is a, a, a kind of a smooth approximation for the hinge loss. This is one way of, of, of uh, uh, you know, um, arriving at the logistic loss. Another way, another way is, always a is always a probabilistic argument. So let me go over the probabilistic argument. Um, uh, uh, I can do very simple algebraic manipulation you know, uh, 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 eighth, eighth grade here, no, not eighth grade, they don't learn uh, exponentials in eighth grade, well, no, in 10th in grade. And, and I can say that these two conditions are equivalent to these, okay? So I just apply logs in, in exponentials. Now, when I, uh, and I'm introducing here a, a sigmoid function. When I look into these, I can see that there is a, a, a hidden probability here. 
Um, so the probability of uh, uh, correctly classifying y equal to 1 given a, it's just this uh, 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 logistic uh, uh, sigma value. Okay, I have pl plus 1 here. And the probability of correctly classify y equal to minus 1, it's going to be 1 minus this, of course, but I can actually see that is minus minus 1. So in an essence here, I have the probability of correct classification. And then I can actually uh, do a very classical argument where one of the arguments that brings statistics and optimization so close to each other, which is the, 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 the optimization of, li of a likelihood function. If I consider the, the likelihood probability, likelihood function of correctly predicting the data, I have the, 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 to multiply all of these terms, um, but um, of course I'm assuming that the, 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 the data is, is, is um, independently drawn, uh, so that the probability of classifying correctly all the y's is the, is the product of the individual probabilities. And then I, have, I can just say that m maximizing any function is equivalent to minimizing minus log of it. Okay. So if I apply minus log of these, then uh, uh, the, the, this becomes a sum, and the sum that I get there is precisely the log of 1 plus e to the power of z, which is what I have here in this case. So that's one, another way of getting to logistic loss, and there is always these two arguments which are kind of interesting, and I thought that would be nice to present. Then, of course, we have to add a... a um, um, a regularization term, okay? Now, so this was kind of a 15 minutes in, in, in data analysis and machine learning from an optimization perspective. I hope this was clear and, and motivating. Um, uh, and, and then this brings, brings me to the issue of stochastic gradient. And, and I'll, I'll start by saying that I have been lying here to some extent because typically we don't have uh, 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 our ultimate goal is not to, to learn from a given set D. No, D is a set that is drawn, or, or, or a collection of samples that are drawn uh, with a certain uh, uh, probability distribution, a joint in, in terms of the feature and the label space. So what we, in, in fact, are, uh, our ultimate goal is, is to minimize the, the, the risk of misclassification, the, the true risk of misclassification, the expected risk of misclassification here, and with some loss function here, and actually when people say expected risk of misclassification, we are thinking about the L as being you know, related to the indicator function. Okay? Now, of course, uh, 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 data, data is, is sample, and so we have the, 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 the uh, we are happy to, to deal with uh, the empirical risk of misclassification. In machine learning, capital N is typically very, very large. You can th think about 10,000, you know, a million, okay? And this is important so that we can actually not, we cannot store all of these uh, uh, elements. And, uh, and so this empirical risk is an, is, 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 is an approximation of, of the, the, the expected risk. Now, in here we are entering in, in the area of statistical learning, which I think is also beautiful. And, 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 and typically there are two approaches, either say, um, we, because th th this problem is too ill-posed, if we consider uh, uh, prediction functions living in any function space, and if we, if, we, if, we, if we allow this probability to be any, this problem is ill-posed. There are these theorems called uh, no free lunch theorems that always trap us. So to some extent, either we restrict the probability, kind of a generative approach, but it's not the approach that is of interest in machine learning, or we res restrict the class of functions, kind of a discriminative approach. And this is what typical is, is, is one can do, and then we can actually prove results th uh, on the, on the uh, regret. You know, we can prove things like, like this. For, for, the true, for the true expected risk, if I consider the optimal solution of the first problem, minimizing the first function, and if I consider the, the, uh, the solution uh, optimizing the, the, the second problem, and then, and then I can, if I, if I, if I uh, consider uh, a, a certain um, function space and, my, and all my predictions live 
in this function space, and, and, and one can actually prove that this guy goes to zero when n goes to infinity. So we, and, 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 and the, moreover, this is, what result, this is the result of PAC, you know, uh, probably uh, approximately correct. But what is more important is actually to look into specific bounds on these and, and, and see the trade-offs of these bounds uh, related to that information. That's, that, that's the whole area of statistical learning, OK? Now, uh, uh, we want to optimize, so we want to have an algorithm to optimize these. And this uh, uh, takes me to uh, 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 Lehigh, because the algorithm, uh, the most simple algorithm to, to optimize uh, um, uh, uh, these functions is called the stochastic gradient. Uh, stochastic gradient and it was dev derived, I think, in the 52 by Monroe and, and Robbins and, 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 and Monroe also at Lehigh University. Now, this paper has like three or 4,000 citations, but it's totally because people in machine learning don't cite it. If everybody was doing machine learning and applying the stochastic gradient algorithm would cite this paper, this paper would have you know, millions of citations these days. So it's really the, 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 what is called the, the, the work horse of machine learning. So let me describe what it is. Um, uh, while writing these slides, I realized that I made a mistake, a mistake in notation, is that I, I had used the Ws before for the, 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 the classifiers here. And, and apologize that these new, my new lambdas here have nothing to do with the previous lambdas. This is just a way that I, know I need to go into have some short notation for things. And I'm going to call f of x uh, these. And I'm going to just represent uh, um, the randomness of, of, of drawing a sample by w. And so that I can, oops, so that I can write my, uh, imp my expected risk in this very compact form. And I can write my empirical risk in also in this very compact form. And each f j of x, you know, the, 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 the j corresponds to one sample point, you know, to one aj and one yj. Okay? Okay. So the stochastic gradient method is a very simple method. It's basically the following. We draw a stochastic gradient, you know, and we choose a step size. The step size is deterministic. And then we do gradient descent. Okay? Now, uh, then the question is, how do you draw the sample, the stochastic gradient? OK, I can just draw one, you know, look at one pair of one feature and one label, OK? And just compute the, 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 uh, this guy here uh, with z being related to that w and that, and, and that y. OK, I can put something as simple as this, OK? Or I can do what is called a mini batch, because this could be ineffective. Uh, this could have a la very large variance. If my capital N is a thousand, I mean, not a million, this way of, of drawing uh, stochastic gradients is going to be, it's going to be a, have a very high variance. So one way of diminishing the variance is doing something called the mini batch, okay? Which is just, you know, sample 10 out of, out of these one million and then take the average, okay? That's the a mini batch stochastic gradient. Um, does this converge? Yes, it does converge. It converges under the following assumptions. Uh, uh, my original function is assumed Lipschitz continuous, uh, with gradient Lipschitz continuous. I, I, I assume that I'm drawing stochastic gradients in, in an unbiased way. OK? Uh, for instance, suppose my, cap, my big N is 1,000. I have 1,000 pairs of A's and Y's. So one way to draw something in an unbiased way is I draw a number uniformly from 1 to 1,000 and, and pick, the, pick that pair, OK? Hmm? OK? And then I put it back to pair. Next iteration, I draw again. This is unbiased. Uh, uh, so in other words, the, 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 uh, uh, its expected value eats the, the true value. Um, we need that the stochastic gradient to have some form of bounded variance. And we need the function, the original function, to be bounded from below. And what is beautiful about the, th the basic theory of Moro and Robbins is that applies to both problems. It applies to both the, the expected risk and to the empirical, to the empirical risk. 
Okay? And, and the results say, in a, in a modern way, they say the following. They say that uh, if the function is strongly convex, and if I choose my step sizes in this form, uh, uh, 1 over k satisfies these, right? 1 over k when you sum is not summable, but 1, one, <laughs> one over k squared it is. Uh, what it basically says, it says that the, uh, the, the gap, the, the optimal gap, the expected optimal gap, goes to zero at the, ra at the rate of one over k, okay? Um, if the function is only assumed to be only convex, then this rate is worse, is one over square root of k. Uh, I'm citing here the uh, a recent book on first order methods by Armir Beck, and here I'm citing um, uh, um, a survey paper by uh, Botu, Curtis, and Nossedal uh, uh, that appeared in Simon Review last year, okay? Now, now I go to do multi-objective and, and do another five minutes of, of basic uh, material in multi-objective optimization. So uh, uh, people here at, at IMPA in Rio have been studying multi-objective optimization, uh, 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 Alfredo, uh, Bernard, and others. Uh, uh, it's uh, uh, very common in practice to have multiple objective functions. My PhD advisor, John Dennis, he went to, uh, when he was already in his 50s, he went to, to Boeing for a sabbatical. At that point, he, he had not done any uh, uh, research in multi-objective optimization. And he spent the whole year at Boeing. He had a very sweet deal that he could go and knock at the, the door of an engineering and, and, and ask this engineer what he was doing, he or she were, were doing. And, and um, uh, he, at the end of the year, he didn't find a single problem which was not multi-objective. He told me that, uh, that he, was, he was very happy that once he found one, but then he realized that the problem was a single objective because the functions had already been scalarized, you know, multiplied by parameters and some. So, so we have, we multiplying, um, uh, we are optimizing multiple functions, you see. Uh, the functions are, I'm going to assume that are smooth, and, and, and we need a meaning. And the, uh, and the meaning of optimi optimality for MOO is the following. First, we, de we have to define a notion of dominance. We say that the point X dominates Y if it is better uh, than, than Y in all the functions. So this is meant component-wise. Um, I'm doing things in the most simple way. This can be generalized. Uh, for those of you that like mathematics, there is a cone hidden here. There is also a partial ordering hidden here. But that is not necessary for what I'm, I'm, I'm saying today. Um, and then a Pareto minimizer is a, a point that is not dominated by any other. So it's a definition by negation, okay? Uh, these Pareto minimizers are also called non-dominated or efficient points. So here's an example. This is what is called a Pareto front. Uh, this problem could have a thousand variables, but it only has two objective functions, F1 and F2. And this Pareto front is the image of uh, my vector function on the set of these uh, Pareto uh, uh, minimizers, okay? So, for instance, if you give me a point and F1 and F2 are here, where you see the, the red dot, that point is not a Pareto minimizer because this one here dominates it, right? It's better than it in both, in both functions. Uh, these points are non-nominated. You can clearly see that you go from one to the other to improve one function, you, 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 you make the other worse, right? So, so they are non-nominated. Um, people in, in practice, they look at Pareto fronts because they give a trade-off between, the, between the, the two functions. This could be, of course, if you have three functions, it becomes more difficult to visualize, but the whole, everything I'm saying here is going to apply to any finite number of functions. Now, in optimization, typically, we need optimality conditions. Optimality conditions are algebraic conditions that are based on equilibrium, equilibrium uh, principles uh, involving, of course, derivatives. And they are important to characterize the solution. They are typically necessary or necessary and sufficient. And they're also important to develop algorithms. Algorithms uh, are typically based on at least first order principles. And those first, first order principles, they come from optimality conditions. And optimality conditions also help uh, uh, setting up uh, stopping criteria for, for, 
for algorithms. So the optimality conditions for Pareto minimization, for MOO, uh, uh, one can be just simply stated as these. A point is a, is a first order stationary if there is no direction that is a descent for all the functions. Okay? And now, if, 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 if I give you the negative gradient, and if I give you a direction that makes an acute angle with a negative gradient, that direction is descent. It's very simple to prove. The fact that the negative gradient points downhill, that was proved by Cauchy in the, light, in the, in the, in the late 19th century. Okay? Um, um, so it's obvious that if this is, this, is, this is false, there is a direction that decreases all the functions, and therefore the point is not a Pareto point. Okay? So that's necessary. Now, in optimization, there's also another beautiful concept called duality. Um, any problem has what is called a dual problem. I mean, this is, can be motivated by game theory, for those of you that like game theory, from zero, zero, zero same uh, games, can also be motivated, can also be seen as, as, as taking a dual of an operator in operator theory. And, 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 and associated to duality theory, there, is the, there is these principles of, uh, of alternative. Uh, here I apply a principle of alternative to say that this is equivalent to finding lambda in a simplex. You heard about simplex today, simplex set, such that the, uh, uh, when you, such that the origin is contained in, in the convex all of the gradients. Okay, these two conditions are equivalent. Now, um, uh, in here, what we observe is that the, uh, the, not to observe, what I should say is that if all the functions are convex, a, a, a point is a Pareto minimizer if and only if verifies any of these two conditions. And this is also very typical in optimization. Under convexity, the first order necessary conditions become sufficient. Okay? Um, uh, also, interestingly here in this case, one can see the following. We can see that the, uh, if all the functions are convex, okay, and if I pick uh, 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 all possible simplexes and scalarize the functions, multiply the functions by the, the coefficients, and minimize each of these functions, it will give me the whole Pareto front. And this is actually a, a mani manifestation of this to some extent. Okay? But, uh, this, so, in other words, uh, 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 that is not an algorithm for the case where the functions are not convex. You know, picking weights and multiplying the functions by the weights and then m optimizing each individual function will not give me the whole Pareto front. It only gives me the whole Pareto front when all the functions are convex. Okay, so, uh, uh, I'm going to skip this. This is for the, the connoisseur. And, and, and then we have what is called the, uh, the a steepest descent for MOO. This was actually discovered by, by, by Fliege and Zweiter, so this is a, as the IMPA stamp. And essentially, what we have to do is that we have to go, al go along the steepest descent direction. But, this, but Cauchy knew that the steepest descent direction was minus the gradient. But what is the, the steepest descent direction for multi-objective optimization? Well, uh, you have to consider the, the steepest for all of them. Okay? And of course, you have to put a regularization here. So the, this problem is in D. This is the direction that you want to find. And if, if I don't add this problem, th this would be unbounded. Okay? When m is equal to 1, I recover minus the gradient. Now, everything I was saying before about uh, uh, the dual, I can apply it here. The dual of this problem in the variable d becomes this. So uh, uh, finding, the, uh, uh, finding a direction d here as the steepest descent for all of them is the same thing as first finding the simplex that minimizes the convex hole, the size of the convex hole, and then just do, co, co, take, those, uh, um, take those coefficients and form it. And so this direction, dk, is the, same, is the same one as this one here, okay? They are the same because some problem one and some problem two, they are equivalent, okay? Um, and this is a common descent direction. With a common descent direction, I can just do some simple algorithm with a line search along it. Okay? Now, what about multi-objective? So what do we do in a multi-objective case? Well, in the multi-objective case that is stochastic, then I have uh, 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 m functions, but they're all stochastic. They can all be 
itself expected risks of misclassification. Okay? So each of these functions now looks like in the first part of the talk. Okay? Um, and then what is the algorithm? Well, the algorithm, which I call a uh, stochastic multigradient algorithm, is very simple. Remember, the algorithm before was, um, was, as, was so, as simple as this. Where is it? It's, uh, 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 it's here, right? So now what I'm going to do is that this G is going to be a G that adapts to the multi-objective case. Okay? So uh, this is a stochastic gradient. And now I have to tell you what is the stochastic multigradient, okay? But we already know what we already know what is the multigradient for in the in the deterministic case, right? The multigradient in the deterministic case is just uh, uh, this guy here that comes from solving this problem. So what I'm going to do in the stochastic case is okay. I cannot observe the two gradients. I have a stochastic problem. I can draw them. And so I will draw. I will. I will. I will draw them and plug it. Plug them here and solve it. So that's what I'm going to do. In other words, I essentially uh, 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 draw stochastic gradients for the unknown uh, uh, gradients of the original problem that is stochastic. I plug them and solve, and I come. I come up with what is called the stochastic multigradient. Okay, as opposed to the, to the to the multigradient in the deterministic case. And then I, I just, my, my algorithm just takes a step like this form. So very simple, uh, putting together things from deterministic multi-objective optimization and stochastic single objective optimization. It's a combination of both. But there is a problem here. So uh, this is the algorithm, I will skip it. The problem is that this is not an unbiased process. In other words, Suppose in this picture, the, 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 the black one is the true gradient, okay? But I cannot observe the two gradients, okay? So I'm, I'm drawing. For instance, I'm taking, I take a pair of one, one feature and one label. So for instance, I, 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 these are two examples of drawing here, the blue and, 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 and the green. So I draw, for instance, a, a, an approximation for a blue approximation for this one. I draw another one for these, and then I plug them into the problem. But plugging into the problem is computing what? The, 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 the one with, with the smallest norm, right? But the one with the smallest norm, in this case, we can very easily see from the picture that is this guy, right? And then I can do the same thing for the green one. And then you could think, if I do many greens and many blues, that the average of these guys here the expected value of these guys will be the, this one. No, it doesn't happen. It will happen if the, the original ones have, uh, were kind of same norm like this. In, in, in fact, I, I did, I, I, we did an experiment. So the stochastic multigradient is biased. Even if all the individual gradients are, bi are unbiased, in other words, even when I'm do, doing the blues, and, and the greens, I do it in an unbiased way. When I put them together in this uh, problem three, which is just computing the, the minimum norm, I get a bias estimate. And there is bias in two senses. Uh, this is the sense of the picture. This is the picture. Because this is, the, this is the, 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 the black. This guy here in the picture is this one here. It's a true one because it, it, is, it is computed with the true weights because it's in the true gradients, the true weights that give the minimum norm. And, and, and so it's not the same as taking average of greens and blues. But I could also say, well, I, 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 instead of doing these, what if I just you know, always look at the weights in the blues and the weights in the greens and take average, is that equal to my expected multi stochastic multigradient method, no. I was surprised because I thought it was. <laughs> and then, and of course, I, I, I had to find a counterexample. So for this is a counterexample. Uh, in this case, uh, you see this 3,000 here? This rather is the capital N, the number, number, the, the number of pairs, okay? So suppose I fix uh, 100 pairs for my batch. In other words, I always, always sample 100 
out of these 3,000. But I sample many, 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 I take the average, okay? It's not zero. Of course, eventually, and this is what this, this plot here are just the, the, the end of this, this process. Of course, when I go to 3,000, it reaches zero. But when I go to 3,000, I'm considering uh, just one draw because I'm just looking at the, the 3,000 components at the same time. So that's the gradient of the, that uh, 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 drawn uh, is the same thing as the original gradient. Okay? So, so we have to deal with these. And the way we dealt with these is, well, it's a very known technique in mathematics, sweep the dust under the rug, right? Uh, uh, for those that do, uh, do analysis. And essentially, we set an assumption that's saying, well, the amount of bias must be of the order of alpha, the step size. Well, why? Because this was helpful for us in the analysis, okay? And the other assumptions are pretty much as before. Uh, and, 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 and eventually with these, I'm, uh, I'm skipping all of these on purpose. And essentially all of these, we get the result of this type, that the, 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 uh, this algorithm will converge to a point in the Pareto front with a rate of 1 over k if the functions are strongly convex, OK? In the convex case, we get also 1 over k, so that's pretty much what we have. Now, I want to spend three, three minutes convincing you that this is actually doable. So in other words, that this assumption that we, we, we pose, we could, we could make it happening in an algorithm in an approximated way. So suppose I'm doing a batch gradient, a batch stochastic gradient, you know, taking several pairs and then, and, and then, uh, and then taking, the, taking the, 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 the average. And suppose that every individual stochastic gradient is unbiased. Uh, um, and suppose that follows a normal law. Or well, if it follows a normal law, then I, we have a result like this, that essentially the amount of bias is proportional to 1 over bi. So we have a way of saying, hey, I can increase this, the size of my mini batches so that these will be bounded by alpha. And so therefore, I have my, uh, the assumption that I've imposed in my, in my, um, uh, uh, in, my, in, our, in our theory. Okay, now, so um, 10 minutes for, the, for what we did in terms of numerical results. Uh, this, slide is, this slide is very complicated, but I want to actually say what we're doing here in, in practice. For those of you that have been pay, paying attention, you could say, hey, but you only have described an algorithm to compute one point in the Pareto front, right? You have a Pareto front, and, and this algorithm that I've, I've been doing, you now it just takes steps and, 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 and reaches the Pareto front. So well, how do I compute the whole Pareto front? Well, uh, typically what people do is actually doing a, do a population-based algorithm. You, we start uh, with actually, you know, uh, a front, a randomly generated set of points, okay? And then if, at each point you apply stochastic multigradient, for, for instance, two steps of it, okay? You do the same thing here. You eventually have a, 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 bunch, a bunch of them. And then you look at all of those, and you just take those that are non-nominated, this one here. So eventually, by doing this, you, you will do something that will converge to the Pareto front. It's a whole totally different deal trying to prove convergence of population-based algorithms to Pareto fonts. That is, an, uh, that is the subject of another talk and more complicated probabilistic arguments that I won't go through today. Now, and very little research has been done on that. Um, so this is like the algorithm. The algorithm here is just what I described over there on the board. Uh, we applied it to um, two types of problems. First, we did uh, some we, in optimization. Uh, optimizers love to collect uh, collection, to collect problems. So for each class of, of optimization problems, there is a collection of problems. These problems are typically very small with very few variables, but very nasty and very difficult. So there is a collection of problems in multi-objective as well. So we pick like 13 of those. And, and by the way, when, I, when, you, when we look at Pareto fonts, they can be convex, they can be con concave. They, they, all these Pareto fonts that I've been showing to you, they look kind of 
have, 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 have connected, but it could also be disconnected. So things can be very nasty. But uh, uh, first, we just pick some collection of points, uh, problems, and we add artificial noise in an additive form, OK? So that we, we have a stochastic problem. Uh, when we compare the, the, the stochastic version of the algorithm, say, to the, to the, the, the deterministic version, the deterministic version is more or less the, the imper version, uh, uh, but in a Pareto front uh, type. Um, in in, 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 um, in MOO, uh, there are metrics uh, to see how well the, the, the algorithms have behaved. There is one called purity, which looks at how many points in the Pareto front have been computed. And then there are, uh, there are metrics that are called the spread metrics they see how well spread the Pareto font is or if the, the Pareto font has holes, okay? But, and this is a very an example, this is a typical example that we obtain. This is a, the result of the deterministic algorithm and this is the result of the, uh, uh, the probabilistic, uh, uh, the stochastic multigraded algorithm. So uh, typically we could also, we could compute well spread Pareto fronts but not as pure. You know, there are more holes here and not enough points. But of course, this is a much, much more powerful algorithm because here I'm using the full gradient, where here I'm just observing the gradient. Okay? So it's, 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 it is computationally speaking, this algorithm costs way, way, way much less than this per iteration. Now, um, have any of you have heard what is called performance profiles? This is actually something very cute. I want to actually just say a few words about these. Uh, in optimization, typically, uh, it, is the, it is the case that many times we have uh, many, many, many algorithms and many problems. So suppose, for instance, and this could be for anything else not optimization related. Suppose you have four methods that you want to try, and you have 50 problems. So you try the four methods on the 50 problems. But then how do you plot the results? How can you plot the results in a visual way that we can look at one plot and see how these four methods have behaved on these 50 problems? Well, one possible answer is what is called performance profiles, which is somehow our probabilities of success. These are performance profiles. They typically curve like these. And, and, and the better is always to be above. So the, this curve is better than these. Each method corresponds to a curve. So a curve, so we have a, a collection of problems and a collection of, say, uh, uh, solvers, methods. And, and each curve that you see there is a curve for a, a given S in here, OK? Uh, depends on an alpha. It is essentially, you divide the, name, the, name, the number of prom, problems by the number of, by the number of, of um, uh, successes uh, relatively to a multiple. So you do something like this. Uh, you do the, the number of problems in P such that some measure, say, say, say CPU time, this could be CPU time, okay? So, oops, less or equal than alpha. So, uh, so when I, when I do alpha equal to 1 here, when I do alpha equal to 1, what am I doing? If I'm doing alpha equal to 1, I'm saying how many problems was my solver S better than the best? So in other words, I'm, trying, I'm seeing how many, problems in, how many problems my solver was the best when I do alpha equal to 1. When I do alpha equal to 2, I say how many, prob how many problems uh, my solver has been within two times the best, the best, and three and four, et cetera. So this is the performance profiles, and these are the profiles that you see there. Um, they're very nice because when you look at alpha equal to one, you see efficiency, number of problems, per percentage of number of problems where I have been the best. And you can kind of see, for instance, if I look at this here and I say, hey, this is uh, 0 0.52, in 52% of the problems, this method was the best. And then when you, when you make alpha 
And when you make alpha bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and you make it alpha 10 to infinity, in other words, you're looking at the end of here, you're basically just looking at how many problems my solver was able to solve. So in other words, uh, this method solve 90% uh, of the problems, whereas this one solve 100%. So it's a very nice, uh, performance profiles are a very nice tool to measure efficiency in here. This is alpha equal to zero, which is, uh, there's a log scale there, so it's when alpha is equal to one. And then, and then, and then robustness, okay? So uh, a method, for instance, this method was more efficient than these, but less robust because it's below that. So the trade-off, okay? So what we can see from these profiles is that there's not too much difference between the, the stochastic and the deterministic. The curves are more or less the same, okay? Now, uh, in the last five minutes, I want to essentially go back to the original part of my talk and say, how is this applied to uh, machine learning? Well, the machine learning has been used more and more, and this is actually very scary, for everything that has to do with, say, data-driven decision making, you know, making decisions about, you know, uh, uh, credit scoring or uh, uh, college or university admissions or uh, um, uh, hiring, you know. Uh, people, uh, companies, institutions are relying more and more on, on, on artificial intelligence to support decision making. And, 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 and the data, there can be natural biases in data. You know, people applying for college could be black or white or Hispanic. And do you want to have a, a, a classifier that, uh, uh, is, uh, 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 that looks at uh, the, the possible unfairness of the, of, of the situation and try to be fair to the different groups? That's the idea. Of course, uh, one possibility is say, hey, let's just you know, um, uh, do classification for the different groups. You know, let's among the black population see who those who, who enter in college. And then among the Hispanics, Hispanic, and then among, among, among the white. But that could also be unfair to some extent. So you want something that mixes mix everything together. You know, that so, so, so in, in this example of classification, you see that there, there could be two groups. You know, say uh, 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 the, 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 the circles are, are say, Hispanics and, 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 and the, the diamond whites. And you want to have a classifier and you can say, oh, what the, 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 the diamonds could be the minority, right? And so you want to be, to have to be a, you design classifiers that are fair. But this is very subjective. And this is when multi-objective optimization can help because looking at these Pareto fronts and putting these Pareto fronts in front of the people that are making the decisions can help them making trade-offs that are more, uh, um, more, um, more reasonable. So, uh, so for instance, in this example, I'm going, to, I'm going to, to tell you there are two groups. There are two groups, essentially. So essentially, you have a bi-objective stochastic problem. Um, we want to determine the W and the B. We are doing linear classification and we're doing a logistic, uh, 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 logistic regression, okay? This very much relates to the first part of the group. Uh, we went to, a, 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 um, we are working with people that have these problems in hand, but right now we only have a, a, a num results for uh, collections of problems that, because there, there is a collection of data for classification. So we went to this collection of data for classification, picked four different uh, groups of data, and we can clearly see, and then we did classification for one group, so you can say, you can think about these whites and Hispanics, for instance, and, 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 and in two of them, in the heart and the SVM guide, you can see that if you're doing, if you're minimizing misclassification for one and the other, you see differences. So that's an indication already that the, the, there, there should be some fairness into that. Uh, the other two groups were doing classification for one group or for the other was pretty much the same. Uh, but you can also apply multi-object optimization for these four. And what we observed is that we observed that the Pareto fronts for those where there is some natural bias, you know, such, such a strong distinction between the two groups, we see Pareto fronts that have a much wider range, from 0.26 to 0.34. And in here, it goes from 0.29 to 0.30. And actually, 
to, for our surprise, these Pareto fronts are even wider than, than these values. You, you could think that the, this guy here corresponds to minimizing just one function, and this one corresponds to just minimizing the other function. It does, but, uh, and, the, and you would think that these things here would correspond to th that point there and that point there, and it should, but the difficulty and the nastiness of the problem made that the, when we were applying the stochastic multigraded algorithm in this front version, that we found an even spreader uh, um, uh, version of the Pareto front, which was very interesting. So, in essence, uh, given two groups of data, one can evaluate this natural bias by observing the range of Pareto fronts. And then, remember from the first part of the talk, uh, 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 we are building a prediction. A prediction is to help when new data comes and we can predict if it is you know, yes or no, if it is positive or negative, if it is admitted into the college or not admitted into the college. And having a, the whole Pareto front, having a Pareto front here, is having essentially a huge number of classifiers. Now, each point here corresponds to one W and one B here, corresponds to one way of classifying. So you have a family of classifiers, and a person that is making the decision can actually see when a new data point comes and can apply different classifiers in the Pareto front and see um, the, the, the balances and the trade-offs. So that's the, 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 the goal of this project. Um, yes, I, I, I have some conclusions and future directions, but I think that is actually no, no for the, I can, I can, I can skip, yeah. It's probably boring for you.